um, I just wanted to make sure that we looked at the whole concept of holy objects and uh, filling stupas and consecration, because it's actually very related to all of these practices we're doing, because it ties into the concept of invocation. So when we were talking about invocation yesterday, do you remember what the point was? Why you invoke or invite at different points in practices and prayers? Do you remember? Why do we do the invocation verse? In your own words. It was only yesterday. <laughs> yes, Skylar, go ahead. Um, I believe it was to um, open up to the reality that was already there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. The Buddhas are already here. We want to be more receptive to that fact. So we invite them even though they're here. Yeah. So whenever you visualize an image like the image of Tara, or you build an image or paint an image, it's almost like an invocation in and of itself. It's this big invitation of saying, I want this archetypal energy here now in this place. So, you know, the Tara energy, the archetypal energy of um, action and protection, we think of as especially concentrated there where that Tanka is. It's kind of like a continuous invocation, invitation for Tara to be there. And so she is, she's right there. Now she was right there the whole time before I brought the Tanka into the room, but in a way it concentrates our ability to communicate by doing so. So we try and think that all holy objects are one in nature with the Buddha, one in nature with the guru deity, but we don't get so literal as to think that somehow if we destroy the tanka that we're destroying the buddha we don't want to destroy the tanka because it's a very important holy object and the image and the symmetry and the proportions came from the enlightened mind and the consecration process came from a lot of positive energy etc cetera, etc cetera. so we're kind of on this razor's edge of it has great importance from its side from our side but don't get lost in it yeah um, we know that sometimes uh, fundamentalists of various religions get upset with Buddhists for having images like they're, um, you know, I don't know, it's a golden calf situation or it's a, you know, whatever kind of triggers that people have from their previous religions. Um, and sometimes even fundamentalists of other religions will blow up our Buddhist statues, right? Or like cut off their heads, right? So that's why buying a Buddha head is seen as not very auspicious. And it was a disrespectful thing that they were doing, chopping off Buddha heads. And now you see them all over the place at like Pottery Barn and it's just, oh, right? But they mean well, I'm sure, right? So what we're trying to do here is to realize that from our side, we want to show these images the greatest respect while not getting too weird about it right? Not getting too literal, not getting fundamentalist, and yet still letting this be a pathway for communication with the divine. So when you build a stupa or you build a statue, you build it hollow in the same way that when you visualize something, it's made of light that's transparent, and then you invite the wisdom beings to it and they merge. So you build a hollow statue or a, a hollow stupa, and then you fill it with uh, as many mantras as it possibly can hold, as well as relics and other holy objects. And of course, part of this is the Dharma is the refuge, the Dharma is the medicine. And so by putting the Dharma inside these images, you're supercharging them, that's one piece. And then you also fill them with things that you think of as sacred, um, like, uh, excuse me, like mommy pills, like relics, sometimes, smaller images, stuff like that. And then any space gets filled with beautifully perfumed incense powder. And then it gets sealed up and then it gets consecrated. And so when it's consecrated, it's very much like the invocation verse that you see in many practices where you're saying, come here, be here now. And it's important that the consecration practice is done by someone 
who has highest yoga tantra and has done a highest yoga tantra full retreat, a serviceability approach retreat, and fire puja. So that's what makes someone qualified to do consecration. So it doesn't actually have to be like a big llama or someone that's qualified to do an empowerment. It can actually be just a senior student who's done their approach retreats. And it's actually a nice idea for your community to gather together some of your senior students who have done retreats and do consecrations together. So if you've got miscellaneous statues and stupas in your house that haven't been filled yet and haven't been consecrated yet, you can make it sort of a fun group process where you do this filling and consecrating process. Okay, so first four pictures, invocation practice examples, all right? You're gonna see Za Hum Bam Ho, the wisdom beings and symbolic beings become non-dual. You're gonna see this in tons of practices. Sometimes it says the wisdom beings and commitment beings become non-dual. So the wisdom beings are the actual Buddhas in the aspect of the deity that you're practicing. The symbolic beings or the commitment beings are what you visualized or what you've built or what you've drawn. So Zahum Bam Ho is this merging mantra. So it draws forth the wisdom beings and then dissolves them into the commitment beings. Doing this involves four stages, invoking or drawing forth the wisdom beings, their absorption into the commitment beings, bind, binding, which means merging or dissolving, and then being pleased, which means becoming joyously inseparable. So that's the meaning of these four syllables. So um, in the consecration text, you'll see a verse that you might have seen in other texts. It says, protector of all beings without exception, divine destroyer of the intractable legions of Mara, perfect knower of all things, Bhagawan and retinue, please come here. Za hum bam ho, the wisdom beings become inseparable from the Samaya beings. Samaya just means commitment. So, in yoga tantra, it's very important to ensure that the commitment beings are established as inseparable from the wisdom beings. As I was mentioning yesterday, it's a part of it is getting rid of superstition. But also this process generally involves first visualizing the commitment beings, then inviting the wisdom beings to approach and merge with the commitment beings. We recite the four syllables za hum bam ho that mark four stages in the process, summoning, dissolving, merging, and becoming inseparable. And with the becoming inseparable is usually the connotation of happily, <laughs> happily inseparable. So you can look at this another time, but stupas themselves, just the outside of them are heavy in symbolism that's really beautiful. And then inside of them is even more. So, Stupas can be of various sizes and can be made for various reasons. So sometimes they can just be on your altar to represent and embody the enlightened mind. Sometimes you have some ashes of a dead loved one that you consecrate as part of the whole ritual and place in the stupa. And then every time you see the stupa and are thinking of your loved one, you're having a positive association. So it's like your loved one is bringing you to the stupa because you want to take a minute and remember them like going to the gravestone. But in so doing, your mind is blessed by a holy object. And then from their side, it's said to make an auspicious connection with the being whose um, ashes they are for their enlightenment. So there's a, a tradition of having set um, ashes in stupas um, for both the benefit of the loved ones left behind, as well as the person who's passed. Um, you're also going to see them outside. And like, um, like Buddhas who are outside, it's important that you keep them off the ground and have a roof. And this is a sign of respect and prevents the degeneration of the Dharma. So whether you have stupas outside, little stupas outside or statues outside off the ground with a roof, right? They're not art. They're not to make your garden pretty. They're to bless the space and they're in the embodiment of your path. So we want to do elevating things like this. 
So the procedure basically is you print the mantra like this and you can barely see it, but it's um, the four Dharmakaya relic mantra printed super tiny, many, many times. And then you roll it around an incense stick. And this double George is to go at the bottom of the statue or the stupa. And if it didn't come with its own bottom, you might also need some metal and uh, you know hot glue gun to seal it all up. And the little rolled, so you first you roll the mantras, then you wrap them in this yellow cloth, and then you fill up the holy object, and then you use powdered incense to fill in all the gaps. So it's a nice group process. So these guys are just rolling mantras, and uh, you can all do it together. You can do it while chanting mantras, but you could also do it just chatting and bonding. Um, because later is the real ritual where you're doing consecration. So, of course, doing it in a contemplative way while saying mantras is lovely, but don't get too tight about it. You can go back and forth between mantra chanting and then, you know, just chatting and bonding because both things are important. So it's a good way of having community development. So if you want to build stupas and you want to fill stupas, there are many resources and this will be in your course notes, but you can find all of this in the FPMT Foundation store. And I think um, some of them are free and some of them are like, you know, maybe $10 max and they're really, really thorough. So stupa filling and consecrating, this should really be done on the, under the supervision of a senior student who has completed an approach or approximation or serviceability retreat, as this is what qualifies one to consecrate holy objects. However, anyone with respect may participate in mantra rolling and filling of holy objects. So many Dharma centers offer holy objects that have already been filled and consecrated. Um, these Dharma centers may request a donation or even, quote, sell holy objects for the, the cost of materials, though that money that uh, is used to, quote, purchase holy objects should only go back towards holy objects and making more holy objects, because money related to Dharma things is very, very heavily loaded karmically. So there's lots of good resources, um, and uh, you can look into that later. So, um, Amanda, did that answer your question? Yes, it did answer my question. Um, I was actually thinking of whether there was a, like an informal way of doing it as well, you know, because I don't live very close to anywhere where I can do all of those things. Um, but I, I think I realize, you know, it's a sacred object and there's one way to put it together, really. Yeah, there, there's short consecration rituals, but you do have to have done a highest yoga tantra retreat in fire puja. Yeah. Uh, yep. Uh, you know, the, the rolling and filling process, all of those supplies you can get wherever you are. You know, you just download the mantra printed out on your home printer, you know, roll it around incense that you have, you know, so you can get them filled and ready to be consecrated for the next time you have a senior student around. Um, or you can just look online and see if there are places that offer them already filled and consecrated. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if, you know, and if you're really like feeling super inspired and you want to sort of make your garden into a Dharma garden with like big stupas and just like super Dharma space, um, the, I mean, the resource I'm always going to go to are people I know, which are in Australia, but um, the Garden of Enlightenment um, at Chen Rezig Institute, their art studio, they know how to do all the things, you know, and they can tell you things like good plaster to buy and bad plaster to buy and where to get good molds and all those logistics. So Chen Rezig Institute's um, art studio is really excellent. I had um, one question. Uh, mm -hmm. You know the first photo you had of the Chen Rezig stupa, the inside of it? Yeah. There were on, on the walls, there were like these golden squares and they didn't fill up the whole wall. And I wondered, are they for people who passed away or were they different prayers or something? Those were um, tsatsa tiles. 
So mm -hmm. tzatzas are another holy object that we make, which is just um, plaster of Paris or porcelain or depending on you know what materials you have. But they're basically like a tile of many tiny Buddhas. So I think mm -hmm. the ones there were um, lots of medicine Buddhas and then it's gold leafed. So you can have them just as a holy object that's beautiful um, and blesses the environment and the people around, or you can do them accompanying with um, practices for your loved ones. And so mixing the plaster with ashes. So um, there's both ways. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was a suggestion that when you were finishing up, um, you could dissolve your green tara into a tonka painting or a painting or something that you mm -hmm. had yeah and is that for people only with initiation or can you just do that um the fully qualified way is only if you have the initiation but it's an okay thought to have yeah it's an okay thought to think the taras that i've been visualizing now absorb into the images i have so it's an okay thought to have but the kind of um, more direct transmission of those images becoming really closely linked is gonna have more power with people that have the empowerment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, you know, and so there's um, always in, in these kind of pujas, there's two options. There's the um, request to abide or there's the request to depart. And so it's like, if you don't have an image, then you request the deities to depart. You actually don't have to do that. You can just think they're still here. I'm just shifting my attention to other things. So that request to depart um, verse, pretty much you can always skip over it. And um, if you don't have an image out, <laughs> the request to stay verse, um, you can just jump over that section. Yeah, but you can have an image even just on your tablet, just propped, you know, with a flower. That's an altar, you know. So it, it's something to consider with our electronic devices is if they have active dharma on them, they are holy objects. And so, you know, treat them as such. And, uh, you know, it's tricky with the phone if it has holy objects and then it's in your purse and you need to go to a public bathroom or something. But if you can sort of like keep it um, somewhat removed, like in a pocket, you know, just like when you're walking around and you've got your mala and if you're out and about, you can't take your mala off and put it on a doorknob or put it on a table before going to the bathroom. So you put it in a pocket instead. Similarly with phones and stuff, it's just, it's a good training to remember if it has Dharma in it, it's becoming a sacred object. I have a friend who has two tablets. He has his Dharma tablet and he has his mundane tablet. <laughs> his two Kindles. <laughs> Whatever works for you. <laughs>